Welcome health science and medical technology students. Welcome CTE teachers. My name is Sarai Franco and I'm here with my colleagues Ripsame and Richard. We are your work-based learning coordinator support team. We welcome you to our work-based learning event that is brought to you by Oakcrest Institute of Science. And today we will be taking a virtual tour of the Institute and explore some of the cool and neat equipment that they have in their labs, in addition to learning a little bit more about their research projects. So I now introduce to you Dr. Paul Webster and his team. Thank you. Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. Um, I must admit, it's very difficult to be able to talk to a screen where I can't see anyone. But um, I hope we can um, give you a good tour of Oakcrest by switching from one camera to another. Uh, we've got people who are placed in strategic positions and they're going to tell you a little bit about what they're doing. And to introduce you to this, I will start um, using uh, a video, a little video thing that we've started working with. We were established in 1998 and uh, moved to Monrovia in 2016 and have been a happy part of the Monrovia community ever since. We are a nonprofit organization focused on academic scientific research. We also offer high quality research experiences targeting a largely underrepresented group. My name is Mark Baum and I'm a senior faculty member at Oakcrest. And here's a picture of Mark with our mayor and uh, Congresswoman Napolitano. And here are some of uh, the people that you're going to meet today working, this was from this morning, and they're doing the COVID-19 testing, which is keeping our lab open. So everybody is um, being tested for COVID-19. Having said that, I will switch over to Jess. Hi, my name is Jess. Uh, I have been at Oakcrest for about a year now. And I spend most of my time in the molecular biology lab, but also I do a little bit of work in drug delivery as well. Um, but to give a little bit of background, I went to the University of Minnesota and got a degree in physiology and been at Oakcrest for about a year, as I said, and been loving it ever since. So one of the things in molecular biology that we often make use of is extractions of nucleic acids and proteins, and you might be interested in a particular protein from let's say a plant source, that's something that I work with a lot, um, a lot of different plant sources, and so you might want to purify a protein, a crude mixture of proteins from a plant source, and work with specific proteins from that plant. Um, so in order to do that, there's a lot of different extraction and purification methods that one might go through to do that, but then in the end, once you've finished your purification or you have a crude mixture of proteins, you can, um, you can run them through a process called SDS-PAGE, which stands for sodium dodecyl sulfate polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. And that is just a complicated way of um, basically saying that you treat the proteins with something that makes their shape and native charge um, electric charge, no longer a factor. And so you can separate the proteins based only on their size. So I will show you what we use to do that. So this is um, kind of one of those cassettes that we use to, you put, plug it into a voltage, voltage source and they will, uh, it'll kind of bubble up and the proteins will separate based on their size and you put the proteins in this, slot here and then that'll separate the proteins based on their size and then eventually once that has taken its course we can come over to this fancy machine here and open it up presumably you have your protein your your gel they've been run onto a, a special type of gel and then you place it in here and open a special program. And then in the end, you get something that looks like this. So this is your purified proteins, or perhaps you have a crude mixture and you just wanna see what you're working with. The, um, 
uh, the proteins are based on uh, separated based on their size, and then you have a standard here, which tells you um, gives you a reference point for what type of proteins you might have in your sample, and so you can um, you can purify your proteins more more intensely to get rid of certain bands and keep other bands, but each band represents a protein of a particular size. So that's pretty much that's pretty much what I do. <laughs> um, also, we have some um, the same similar types of cassettes for nucleic acids, and you'll use this same method for visualizing those nucleic acids um, that you might extract from a DNA sample or anything like that. And then also this is a PCR uh, designated room. So if we go over here, we can also see uh, some of the PCR instrument um, that we have in here. And we also have a couple of things like this in the uh, microbiology lab as well. So I think since we have so little time, that's all I really have <laughs> for everybody. But I'm happy to, um, I guess, toss it off to JC. My name is John Cortez. I've been with Oakcrest for about over 11 years now. Um, started off with Oratech before I transferred over to Oakcrest about three years ago. And I do drug delivery and as well as other um, microscopy duties. Um, one of the things that I've worked with is the confocal laser scanning microscope, which is what we have here. I'll show you here. This is the eyepiece. This is where our specimen goes. And what's unique about this microscope is that it deals with lasers. It, it scans with lasers and what we're detecting are these fluorescent markers that we've labeled on the cells. The different markers fluorescent different wavelengths and these, act, these lasers will activate, will excite these, these markers and fluoresce and we can detect the fluorescence on this instrument right here. Um, this one we have here is it has four lasers on it. We can scan with four different colors and use di four different tags, and di four different uh, fluorescent markers on our cells. If I move you up closer, I can show you uh, what this can do. Uh, let me get you right here. And I'm going to shut the lights off. Give me a moment. And I hope that's better. Maybe not, but as I mentioned, we have four different lasers, four different channels that we can let scan with, and we've used different colors. In this example here, if you can see my cursor on the upper left window, is you'll see a bunch of blue dots, and this is a, a marker that we use that specifically labels DNA in the cells. So these are all the cell, cell nuclei that we can see on our slide. Uh, and if you look to the right, this is what it would look like if we were looking at it under just a regular translucent or transmitted light. Now, one of the, another marker that we use is uh, conclavulin A, and this is very specific for glycoproteins but on the membranes of the cell. And you can see that we have a lot of, uh, you see a lot of the outline of the cell. <clears throat> so it's very, it marks very good marker here. And in this particular case, we, we, we grew some epithelial cells and epithelial cells should, depending on how old they are, should express keratin. And here we have an antibody that's very specific for keratin. And you can see some red uh, labeling here. And this then is the overlay of all four of these images. So we can take this, once we scan it and get into digital format, we can do much, a lot of things with this information. We can make uh, the whole image. This is our whole image, all four overlays. We can turn off certain, certain uh, channels just to look at certain channels that we're interested in. In this case, let's see uh, how's the keratin labeled. If we take off all the conchalabinum A and just look at the uh, keratin as well as the nuclei of the cells, and you'll see that even though we had a lot of cells here, uh, not all of them labeled with the red, con uh, red K13 uh, marker that we were interested in. So again, 
we once we get in digital format, we can do a lot of things. And here in this case, what we can do is we can scan. One of the advantages of a laser of the confocal laser scanning microscope is you can scan different depths of your specimen and what they call a Z stack. And if you look at this, you can see that we can go through the depth and you'll see how things change as we go deeper and deeper through the sample. And that's to the bottom. So you go from the bottom, go through the sample, you'll see nuclei and you'll see cells come up and go. And we can adjust that depth with the software and how, how thick these uh, slices we want to make them. That's the Z-Stack. And once you get that, again, you can manipulate the data um, and make what's called a, comp uh, a three-dimensional image. So again, looking at the screen, I can take that information and I can basically make a, well, if I click it properly, I can do a 3D, I can rotate the image in, in 360 degrees or however, however I wish to rotate it and you'll see how the cells are in this particular case, the cells are in agros, it was embedded in agros, so you'll see them. They're not necessarily flat, but uh, they are embedded within the agros and you can tell that they're, they're all right there. There's a lot of things we can do with this microscope, but uh, this is a very important instrument we have here and it's very, and very fun to use, very easy to use. Thanks, John. Thank On to um, Destiny and Sarah. Hi, everyone. My name is Destiny. Um, I am a student at UC Davis. I'm currently finishing my senior year online, and I'm working part time here at OCRES along with my partner, Sarah. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah. I'm currently a college student and I'm a part-time researcher here at Oak Crest uh, where I have the opportunity to do some microscopy and we're going to show you what our lab looks like. Alright, so when you look at a textbook you see membranes, you see cells, but I mean how do you how do you get to that point, right? So that's a little bit what we do with the microfilm and with our samples and so I started here interning with Drosophila and we wanted to look at neurons. So an example of that is we would get our fly tissue and then what we would do is we do some chemical processing which is a lot of other stuff I won't get into because we don't have time for that but once we finish that process we get little blocks like this and so this the sample is a little blocky tip and then we embed it in resin so it's just kind of like a plastic that we embed it in and then we use a special device known as the microtome that Sarah is going to discuss a little bit further. So this machine over here is the microtome, and this is a special device that is going to allow us to cut the sections in very thin sections. Um, over here is like our monitor, and we have our predetermined lengths or measurements. So our, our next step following from doing the resin block would be to mount it on the microtome arm. And we're going to give it a shape with both razor blades and a glass knife. And these glass knives we actually do in-house. Uh, they start off with like a rod of glass and then we eventually cut them this thing. And then we cut that in half and give it the triangle shape that's gonna allow us to cut the sections. So the thickness that we're looking for is about 60 nanometers. And fun fact, a hair on everybody's head is about 80,000 through 100,000 nanometers. So you can just imagine how thin the section has to be for us to collect it. And after we give the shape, we're gonna cut it with a special knife that Destiny is gonna talk to you about. So once you've finished at smoothing out the specimen and you get into that pyramid shape, you wanna use this knife here, which is a diamond knife. And it's very good at cutting ultra thin sections, which we want so that we can get really nice images. And another fun fact about this, when they're training you, they're going to tell you this is about $3,000 so that you don't break it. So you can see that diamond there is about three millimeters thick, uh, long, and each millimeter you can say is about $1,000. So you want to be very careful with that. And you want to avoid touching the inside of the well here because you don't want your oils to disturb or um, dirty up the, uh, the section that you're cutting. And we fill it up with water. And so what happens is we have the microtome go around kind of in a clockwise motion. And what it does is it slightly grazes against the diamond and then the sections are gonna float on the surface of the water. 
And what we do after is we're going to use grids that Sarah's going to show you to pick up our sections. So among the various types of grids that we have, these are the two most common that we use here. And these are about, are about like three millimeters thick or wide. And so what we do is we're using the surface tension of the water, we're gonna place the grid on the side of the microtome and get it like on top of the section. And then we're gonna pick it up. After that, we can either put it on a cover slip um, and use that for light microscopy, or we can prepare it with staining for the electron microscopy. And Paul's gonna show you a video of how that would be in real time. Is this the diamond? And the specimen is in this block here, and you can see the first section coming off onto the water. It's floating on a, a water surface. So remember, this diamond is three millimeters long. The section is tiny. So let's skip. And you can move the sections around with an eyelash. And you can pick them up with a loop or a, pick them up like that and they stay on the water surface. Now let's go on to um, Sophia. Hi there, hi everyone. I'm Sophia Rivera and I'm a microbiologist here at Oak Crest Institute of Science. I've been here for about six years now, and just really briefly, I got my degree in kinesiology at Cal State Northridge, um, where after obtaining that, I was a professional flamenco dancer for seven years before I gave up the describing artist lifestyle and kind of pursued something I had an interest in, which was science and biotech. So I got um, some degrees, uh, certificates at Pasadena City College at their biotechnology program. And then from there, I got a year long internship at Caltech, investigating neurodevelopmental biology, and as well as honing molecular and imaging skills. And then right away, I was snatched up by OCRES, where not only do I use molecular biology very, very much, I also do a lot of microbiology. So I'm going to take you on a little quick tour around the micro lab. Right behind me is a biosafety cabinet where we do a lot of our work. It is a nice clean space, right now it's off. And in that video earlier that Paul mentioned, that was me in one of these labs um, processing the samples for our COVID extraction and testing that we do. And also right here on this side, I don't know if you can see it, but this is a minus 80 freezer. So you might be hearing on the news now this minus 70 degrees, it's very cold, minus 70 degrees Celsius. We have one of these freezers here for long-term storage of samples. And I wanted to show you some of our microbiology techniques. So I don't know if you know what micro means, but it's very tiny. When you think of microorganisms, you think of things like bacteria, fungi, viruses, things you can't see with the um, naked eye. But what we do here is we grow them and we grow them in things like Petri dishes. And now these are just fake Petri dishes, um, but these dishes are just, you know, to show you a little demonstration, um, one of the, projects I was working on many years ago was with the Huntington Library where we wanted to identify different plants that were growing in um, different, not just different plants, but different bacteria that were growing in the plant. So here you can see all these little polka dots. Hopefully it's kind of in focus. And these are representative oh, okay. of bacteria. And then you can see some are bigger, some are smaller. We have one right here, which it, it kind of fell over when it was in the four degrees in the refrigerator for a while, so it kind of smeared down. But it's kind of cool because you can see the different colors of the bacteria. And so when we, what I did was I would take these, for example, these colors, and I streak them on another plate. And these plates, they just have an agar medium, so something that provides um, a nutrient source for the bacteria. You can see the three different colors. Isn't that kind of cool? But we don't just grow bacteria here. We also grow fungus. And so in here, I have a sample of some candida. This is a, a fungus that you can find on the body sometimes. And in this case, it's nice and blue. And this one was right here came from a plant sample. It's kind of hard to see because this is just a two dimensional picture, but they're actually, it does kind of pop out at you almost like a little volcano, kind of neat. And not just on these 
um, agro-solid substrates, we also grow them in liquid media. So just like you might have a preference for different types of foods or allergies, bacteria and fungi are the same thing. They have different preferences for foods. So I will show you just real quick, this big jug right here is one of our nutrient broths. Just a very straightforward broth. Fun fact, early microbiologists use chicken broth <laughs> to grow to culture their, micro their, their bacteria. We have one right here, it's my favorite. This one's called Terrific Broth. It's kind of a golden color. The part that makes it terrific is sugar, extra glycerol. And then even this one right here looks just like water, but there's actually very small amounts of minerals. This is a minimal freshwater broth. Not broth, just media. And I also have right here two cultures to show you. So this one is E. coli, and this we grow them in these just plastic tubes right here. And I'm not sure if you can see the pellet right there at the bottom, but that pellet, we refer to it as a pellet, is just all the bacteria that's fallen down to the bottom of the tube. And normally we grow them in incubators that have certain temperatures and um, atmospheric conditions. The next one I'm going to show you is kind of spooky, it's red. This bacteria is actually the one that gives you acne. And this one does not like oxygen, so we have to grow it in a special incubator that has no oxygen, an anaerobic chamber. I don't know if you want to guess what that red color is. <laughs> I have a little demonstration of it on a plate too where we do a streak. So for example, from this big culture, maybe we want to get one single colony, or a colony is actually all of these different organisms into one of these little polka dots. And we start here and we just start spreading them out. And as we spread it out, it gets a little bit thinner and thinner and thinner. And on this plate, for example, we could actually do it one more time and maybe we can get these single colonies. So we get it something like this, where it's much more easy to actually pick from. And that's just a little bit about what we do here and what I do. I just wanted to really show you that. Um, if you have any questions, please just email us to type it in in the comments in the chat box. And let's see. Oh, I will pass it on to Simon. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Sophia. Um, one thing we uh, practice here at Oakcrest, whether it's working with bacteria or cells, um, is aseptic techniques. I'm in the cell culture room, and like I said, we practice aseptic techniques, which means we work very um, clean and we try to minimize contamination. Um, I just wanted to mention that. So behind me, there's a, uh, a similar hood to what Sophia mentioned. This is a laminar flow hood. This is the uh, where we where I work with the cells in a clean environment. And also behind me, we have a freezer and a refrigerator where all the reagents are stored. And up here uh, and down here, these are two incubators. So when I'm growing cells, the cells require 37 degrees Celsius and 5% CO2 environment to replicate the human body, or mammalian body, sorry. Guy right here where I store the cells. It's a little container with liquid nitrogen. I'm just gonna open the lid. You can see all the liquid nitrogen in there. And each one of these contains like a little row of vials where we store the cells. And we work with uh, different cell lines, whether it's uh, African green monkey cells, human cells, mouse cells. They all start here. And eventually, we move them onto, let me move the camera again. So once I thaw the cells, I can put them onto a small flask like this one right here. This is the smallest we have. And once this gets full, so keep in mind, the cells are growing on this surface at the bottom. So they're not covering the entire flask. They're just grown on the back surface. So in the incubator, they're stored like this and they're growing at the bottom. So once this gets confluent or full, we move them onto a slightly larger flask and we can continue growing larger if we need more cells for an experiment. Um, so, I have a few flasks in the incubator if you want to see. Okay, so I'm going to carry you over here. And up top you can see that there are two large flasks. 
and a small one over here, and another one down here. So I'm not going to disturb them too much. Um, it's a little risky just opening that, actually. But I wanted you to see inside of an incubator where the cells are growing. Um, yeah, so in a uh, cell biology and cell culture room in this room that I work in uh, to clean our hands, we use 70% ethanol. And to clean the plastics before we throw them away, we use 10% bleach. And we also autoclave the trash once we're done. And this is to minimize, um, you know, things growing from the trash and to minimize contamination and to keep the room clean. So there you go. Please uh, ask me any questions if you want in the comments. And How often do you change your gloves when working with bacterial colonies? But I think that also works with cells. Um, I lost, I lose count. It's, we don't use one pair of gloves every day. It's, if you, if they're dirty, if they're ripped, you just change them out. Um, you want, you don't want to wash your hands with the gloves on. It's not good practice. Um, but if you keep your hands clean, once you have the gloves on, you can use them for an entire experiment. What temp, um, well, there's a good one here. How badly does it affect how the cells grow if you take it out of the incubator? We should switch, go soon. It's not, it's not too bad. Uh, you have a few minutes to work with the, with the cells outside of the incubator. You have time to look at them in the microscope to see if they're contaminated, if they're healthy, if they're happy. And yeah, so and you don't want to leave them out for, I would say, 15 to half an hour, 15 minutes to half an hour. Thanks, Simon. I'm going to interrupt you and send you off to Derek. Okay, guys. Uh, my name is Derek. Uh, I've been with Oakcrest uh, about three and a half years now. I took a weird route coming here. I went into the Army after high school, was there for eight years, uh, became a repair technician for another nine years. Didn't like that. Went to school uh, for bio, funnily enough, given what I'm doing now. And um, while I was in school, needed a job. And uh, someone linked me up with Oakcrest. I've been working here ever since. Um, so the project I'm working on right now is called the Green Rust Project. Um, essentially, it's a, an iron compound. It's found natural, uh, naturally deep in, within the earth. Um, it, it's a compound. It's iron 2 and iron 3, usually complex with another ion, something like a carbonate or chloride, a bromide, things like that. I've got a, a sample of it here. Uh, I'm not sure how well you can see it, unfortunately, because it's uh, coated the uh, glass pretty well, and it looks mostly black right now, but it's generally a very deep blue-green. Um, this is only when it's um, completely anaerobic. It reacts with oxygen um, fairly quickly and breaks down into just regular rust. Um, we're looking at it mostly because there is a belief that this may be a, part of the one of the things that helps catalyze the formation of amino acids in the early earth so we this may actually be one of the things that led to life on earth so we're doing a lot of work with it right now um as for how we work with it i'll show i'm gonna actually show you the end phase of what we do with this just because otherwise i'm gonna be running you all around the lab and making everyone very dizzy um but once we've synthesized it in anaerobic conditions we actually mix it with uh glycerol to keep the oxygen out and we put it into the um, XRD, which I can show you right here. If it has switched, there we go. So ah, let's pull back a bit. So this is the XRD. XRD stands for X-ray diffraction. So what we do, that's opening. We take our sample, we put it into one of these uh, holders right here. You can see there's a little depression in there. We fill that with our sample and make it nice and flat. We put that inside here. So the sample sits in this here. And this right here is an x-ray source. So it's actually firing x-rays onto the, right onto the kind of the edge of our sample. The detect, and they bounce off, they diffract off of the sample, bounce off of it into our detector here. And the detector actually moves in a arc across like this and begins to take, you know, and you get peaks of energy where the x-rays are being uh, diffracted. And we get a reading off of that that looks like this on our screen. 
And so these peaks here correspond to um, specific bond angles, uh, specific types of bonds, and you get a signature that is unique for each type of compound. And so by doing that, we can say, okay, we actually succeeded, we made green grass, we can compare where these peaks are, how they shift, that gives us ideas, for instance, um, the, the structure of our, comp of our green rust, how things are formed. We can find impurities in our green rust that way. Um, and we can do lots of comparisons. So we have uh, a few samples that we've run through here. Just, and these are just different things we look at. We can compare where those peaks are, how high the peaks are to give us more information on, our, you know, on what we're looking at. So I think I actually do have a little more time, so I hope this doesn't make anyone too dizzy. We are gonna run, unfortunately, my job involves running all over the place, out of the instrument room. And as you can see, I get my exercise in somehow. And to our glove box. I think everyone can figure out why it's called the glove box. So this is where we actually uh, measure out the green rust. So we, we take our precursor compounds, our, our iron salts, and um, we weigh them in here. This is a, a chamber that has zero oxygen in it. It's actually nothing but argon. There's no oxygen, there's no water. This lets us weigh things out very well. We take the green rust, the iron salts out, we mix them together. We extract all the oxygen because we mix them with water. We bring them over to the auto titrator right here where we add sodium hydroxide. That sodium hydroxide uh, starts the reaction, that reacts everything and produces the green rust itself, at which point we get to run over here. Almost, almost, almost. To the anaerobic chamber which looks exactly like the glove box. And we can see a few of our samples hiding out inside there. Um, this is like the glove box out there, but this lets us work with water. And this is where we can actually work with our green rust samples. And that little blob of black right there is our green rust. So I don't know, does anyone else have any questions? And I think we're done. Thanks, Derek. I'm going to Move you on to Irina now. Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Irina Butkevicini, and I have been working at all Seems to be how I do things. Um, yeah, I, I received my uh, chemistry degree in uh, uh, in Russia, and uh, I immigrated to the United States. And for you know, like in now ten years, I'm working in Ocrest. I have been working now on a part intravaginal ring project, and uh, um, an estimated like five thousand new HIV infection occur each day worldwide. Uh, Pre-exposure prophylaxis is a way for people who do not have HIV but who are at substantial risk of infection to protect themselves. And Orcrest has developed um, uh, a part intravaginal, a part intravaginal uh, ring platform uh, for delivering single, dual, uh, and triple antiretroviral drug. So, as you can see, this is um, uh, silicon um, part intravaginal ring platform. It's like this ring is a 10 cavity ring. Um, uh, I have to, first I have to make a medical device. This is just platform. So I have to manufacture a drug uh, tablets, we call pots, and we can make, you can see sizes small, very thin, and the big pots, different pots. Yeah, we can see. For that, we are using um, a tablet press. As you can see here, it's a tablet press. We have uh, upper dice, lower dice, and we can press tablets by uh, changing pressure. Okay, so, and uh, also what I should do when I'm making medical device, I have to 
perforate to make delivery channel from another side, as you can see. This is a platform. Here's the ring already with uh, parts uh, and retroviral drugs. So first I have to perforate rings uh, by using different size of punches. I'm using different beautiful color punches, different sizes, so I can make different delivery channels. After that, I have to insert the drug tablet into the ring and seal with silicone. And from this medical, uh, from this, sorry, uh, med um, uh, channels, delivery channels, the drug will release in the body. And, but before the medical device going to pharmacy, when people can buy the medical device, it's a long, long way. We started from the lab, uh, dissolution, lab dissolution study, it's lab study, we are testing all rings. We put in a, uh, in a, some solvent and every day we are um, measure concentration. We have to know how the drug release in our jar in a solvent. After that, we send the rings uh, to animal study. We have animal study. So for animal study, we can use the size of the ring. It's good for sheep study, also good for, good for humans. And this is small, small medical device. It's a good for monkey study. We also have study, like uh, we are uh, testing uh, the rings on the um, monkey study, animal study. And after that, we have few uh, study uh, on humans. And after that, if it's everything approved, you can buy a medical device in the purpose. Yeah. Thank you. So you if you have, have some questions. Uh, absolutely mm -hmm. not. Um, I'm sure that will come later. Thank you. I'll pass on now to Christian. Hello everyone, my name is Christian Pinales and today I'll be talking to you a little bit about the uh, scanning electron microscope or short for SEM. So before you put anything into the SEM, it must be dehydrated. Anything that goes into here, it goes into a very high vacuum. And that vacuum will, of course, suck out any water. And if any water is in the, in the specimen or material that you want to look at, it's going to damage our microscope. So um, the specimen would go in here after, of course, it's dehydrated. Uh, first of all, we're going to be putting them on a stub. So these are stubs. Um, you can see one right here. So we add a carbon paper to the top of here and we're able to stick or put any specimen or materials that we want to look at onto there. And the purpose of the carbon is to conduct any electrons that are hitting the specimen and being able to remove them from the specimen because this is a scanning electron microscope. Electrons are um, shot at the specimen and therefore charging can occur if the specimen cannot conduct its own um, electrical charge, of course. So that's one issue when we're using this scanning electron microscope. We can't just put anything in it. Um, biological samples are, are kind of hard to image, um, but we can actually look at other things. Like right now, I'm currently looking at sugar and channels that are created by them. Um, I look at random little things like rocks and stuff like that. I'm interested in myself, but I want to see how they look at the nanoscale. And um, I can also look at any materials that we may um, find outside and stuff, biological, of course, like wings. And um, so one image that I have right here actually is a fungal growth that we had in-house. And we were very interested in how it actually looked at the nanoscale. So we um, put it onto the stub, like I said, with carbon paper, and it actually conducted pretty nicely. Um, so in the puck by itself, we're able to put six specimens. So I'm able actually to move and navigate using these, and we can look at different things. Um, we can actually also um, control the amount of electrons that are shot at the specimen, so we can give higher chances of the images coming out better. Or if we need more charge on the specimen, then we can also do that as well. Um, one main thing and issue that we can arise with the scanning electron microscope is that this sample cannot be too big. So um, we do look at very tiny things. And um, there's other microscopes, of course, that we have in-house that we can use to look at bigger specimens, um, such as the light microscope. And um, hopefully next time I'll be able to show you guys something like that. But if you guys have any questions, please put them in the discussion board and I'll be passing over to Amalia. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Amalia. Uh, I'm an analytical chemist here at Oakcrest. 
Um, and I'm going to show you some of what we do in the analytical lab. Uh, uh, Irina was talking about the rings for drug pro prophylaxis that we use. Um, but we have to find, we have to test uh, the drugs that come out somehow. So when we put those into, when we're testing those in, in people or animals, uh, we have to find out how much of the drug is coming out and where it's going. So one of the things that we use to do that is a mass spectrometer. I'm going to turn my camera around so I can show you. And we're actually running samples right now. Um, so this is, this is running some of the samples from one of the studies that we did uh, in the past couple years. Um, this is the mass spectrometer. And what a mass spectrometer does is it separates and measures uh, a compound by its mass. So when we're looking at drugs, we know exactly what mass that drug is supposed to be. And we can isolate it and isolate down to it and be able to measure how much of that drug is there while looking at nothing else. So this mass spectrometer is called a triple quadruple. It's able to be, get very, very specific. So we're only looking at one thing at a time. Um, and we're looking at one particular drug in, in this study um, and trying to measure how much is there. And in this case, we're looking at how much that got into the tissue. So when we have that ring in an animal, the drug's going to come out of it. Uh, and when it comes out, it's going to get absorbed into the tissues, it's going to be in the local fluids, it may end up in the bloodstream, and we have to test and see how much drug went into all of those different places. So right now, we're testing uh, the, how much drug went into tissues. So what, how is that done? Well, we have to prep the samples that the tissues get processed and enzymatically degraded, and we put them in this little tray right here, and it's a 96 well. Uh, tray and we have both standards where we know the concentration of the drug so we can measure and correlate the con known concentration of drugs and what signal we get for that to the unknown amount of drug in the actual samples. So we have both a standard curve which is a set of known concentrations in increasing amounts and all of the actual samples and all processed the same way. And we have to clean that up so that we don't get other junk in it that can damage our system. So that uh, gets injected through with this needle right here. It travels down to the column compartment where we separate it out. Uh, it takes a certain amount of time to travel through the column. So we know at what time exactly we're supposed to be seeing our drug. So we can identify it and make sure it's the right one because it's coming off at the right time. And you'll see in a second why that's important. Then it travels through this tube right here into our ionization chamber. And I don't know how well you can see it on your screen, but there's a small needle in there that's got a spray coming out of it. And that spray is pointed just to the left of the hole that actually goes into the instrument. And we've got a gas that is blowing across it and only ionized particles uh, are able to actually go into the instrument. So while we've got a spray of liquid, only the particles that get ionized, which means they carry a charge, are able to be pulled into the instrument. Now you can't actually see uh, everything on the inside, but there's a series of rods that carry a charge and they alternate creating an electromagnetic field that only the compound that we're looking for, only the compound that has the right mass is able to pass all the way down through to our detector. So this is the detector in here. And this turns it into an electronic signal that we can then read on the computer. So what does that actually look like? Let's come over here and I will show you on the computer. So here is the screen. So this is actually a blank. There is nothing in here. And if you can see, you do actually see one peak here at 1.8 minutes and it's got a fairly decent intensity of uh, over 4,000 um, counts per second or, or over 4,000 units. Uh, that is not our compound, which is why it's important that we know what retention time or at what time the compound is supposed to show up. So if we click through, this red peak here is what's known as an internal control. This is something that we add to every sample 
that we can normalize our sample to. It goes through all of the same processes, which means if our volumes are different or if something happens to the signal in the instrument, it happens to both. So when they are, when you take the ratio of both of them, you get a much more accurate picture of what's actually, of how much is in the sample. So here we go, we're going through some standards, and there we go, there's our peak right there. And I know that it's supposed to come off at exactly 2.11 minutes, and there it is. And I know that is our peak that I'm looking at. Amalia, yes. what was the, um, in your blank, what was the blue peak that you first showed? That is we're that, not, that is not our compound? It's I not don't that. know, oh, I don't know just, what that is. We know that, <laughs> We know because of the way that the system works um, that it has exactly the same mass and a fragment piece, as in a, a, a part of the molecule that has the same mass as the compound we're looking for. But because these are biological samples, they're extremely complex, which means there can be hundreds to possibly even thousands of compounds that have similar structures, similar masses, um, which is one of the reasons that having a retention time is so important. This may be a piece of a protein, it might be a metabolite. My guess is um, because these are tissue samples, it's probably part of a protein. It might be a, a, a piece of the protein that was broken off, so a, a peptide section. Um, but it's not at the right retention time, which means it doesn't have the same <clears throat> chemical properties of, as the compound we're looking for. So I know that's not it. Um, but that happens when you have really, really complex biological samples, is you can get some stuff showing up with the same mass uh, as, as what you're looking for. But if, if you can see in the, I don't know, there, you can't really see much right now. This is, this is still a blank, but this bottom right here, that is the 2.11 uh, retention time. And as we go, you can see, yep, something just popped up right there. That's an eight nanogram per milliliter standard. And there, it's a little bit larger. That is a 180 nanogram per milliliter standard. And that is 2,500 nanograms per milliliter. So this is all in nanograms per milliliter, which is a very, very low concentration. Uh, we can look at anything in the low microgram per milliliter range, nanogram per milliliter range, and sometimes even down into the picograms per milliliter range, which is very, very small amounts of material. Um, if we have higher concentrations, we have other methods that we can look at uh, for that, just like the, light, like the microscopy, where different size samples, you're gonna use different kinds of techniques. Same here, if you have different concentration ranges, different amounts of drug that you're likely to be seeing, we can use different techniques that are good for those different uh, concentration ranges. And that's basically what I do every single day. <laughs> so I think, uh, I don't know if my time is up, um, but if you have any questions, um, throw them at me. Thank you, Amalia. It is now 3.55. Um, we've had uh, a lot of uh, people talking. Uh, it's been very intense, um, and there's been quite a lot of questions in the chat box. Uh, Chris and I have been um, trying to do uh, the answers, um, probably not the best ones, but uh, uh, it's interesting that we tend to agree on the answers. Um, if there are any more questions, please let, let me know. If you have any questions after the um, session here, you can email me at my email address, which I've just put into the chat box. And if you've got questions for me, I can answer them. If you've got questions for other people, I can pass them on. So um, put your thinking caps on. Um, come up with some good questions. Uh, you've seen a lot of different things. Um, almost too much to digest. Uh, I look forward to hearing your questions. Ah, do you enjoy your jobs? That's a good one. Yes. I think I can, uh, Simon says yes. Amalia, she's thinking about it. She's put two thumbs up. Christian's nodding his head. Look at this. We love our jobs. I think Irina's actually putting a thumbs up as well. <clears throat> there are challenges. 
Um, it says, do you have any challenges in your job? Um, anybody want to um, answer that? I can say that uh, uh, every day, sometimes things work, sometimes things don't work. Uh, the trick is to do more than one experiment if you can, so that uh, if one's working, the other one's not. All these different roles. And so what are some things you hope to achieve? I would say we would want to change the world to make things better for humanity, to make things better for everything that happens in the world. A question for Sophia. What was it like doing research at Caltech? What was the biggest takeaway from such an opportunity? Sophia, I think my turn. Sorry, I'm over here. She's I'm over else. here now for my desk. Um, it was amazing. It was an amazing opportunity. Um, we had a small cohort, so there was only two of us who went to Caltech, and I was really fortunate and lucky to get that. And it really kind of paved the way for me to think, you know what? Yeah, this is something I really enjoy. This is something I want to keep doing. Um, and I'm super grateful for that opportunity. It also gave me a really good foundation of micro, uh, not, not necessarily micro, but more molecular techniques and also just general lab biotechniques using QPCR, which we do every day, especially when we do our COVID assays, um, as well as doing imaging and microscopy and just working in the lab and um, getting that experience. So I highly recommend to everyone, if you're kind of interested in pursuing this, try and get an internship somewhere. Um, shadow someone, volunteer, because that will maybe, it'll let you know if it's something that you might want to do. That will take us to the bottom of our hour. So thank you all. Thank you, students, for your questions. Um, again, if you still have questions, remember Dr. Webster did go ahead and uh, share his email in the chat box. So you are more than welcome to uh, send in your questions, comments to him. Um, and there will be another session after this in December. So just know that there's, this is a continuation series. So there will be another session on December 9th that your teachers um, will go ahead and share with you. Um, so one more time, thank you, Dr. Webster, and thank you, Oakcrest team. Uh, we truly enjoyed your presentations today and showing us your equipment, your research, and all the wonderful activities you guys are doing. I'm sure the students have learned something new today and everyone's leaving inspired. Um, students, there's still a few of you guys that still need to go ahead and sign in, so make sure you do that. Um, and again, our next event for this series will be on Wednesday, December 9th, and we hope to see you there.